power is what we've been talking about in the church, and that's how power God unleashed in the call. And when we think about that, I'd love to see that here, that power unleashed, to, to know that God is with us and that we're doing the things that he's asking us to do. That's the church. The church is the hope of the world. Like you've probably heard that statement before if you've been in the church, you know, at least a year. The church is the hope of the world. But it's only because of the power of Jesus through us. It's, it's not by anything that we do. It's, it's, it's the power that what happens when Christ comes inside of us to, to, to be able to live. Because on our own, we can't do it. And we need to hold on to, to Jesus for all of the work and then be able to take him uh, to all uh, ends of the earth. You know, and Paul was one of those things that you know, we recognize because that has happened you know, just yesterday. I know Barbara, your grandson's going. Can I tell you? I'll share with you what I know. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. The mission uh, group that he's with, they were sent by mom and child. This is his second time in the community And I just found out that yesterday that their group just left Friday and they were missed their connecting flight in Istanbul. And so they're not back in the States yet, but they just left just before this earthquake hit. There was five of them. They go up into the mountains and take med um, medical supplies and the gospel. And this was his second trip. And he, my grandson, Nathan, is a pastor in Alabama. Let's go. And he was with his group and he just left. Yeah, I, I thought, I, I didn't realize that. They, they, that's great. I knew he was going again. I called Minnie two weeks ago and I said, okay, have they left? And he said, or are they there? And she says, they're there. They're supposed to be home this weekend. Okay. And they just left Friday. Great. Well, I'm glad you did get out. Thank you yeah, so much. They're for the way home. They're not back in the stage yet. But they are still there. Great, thank you so much, Bob. Appreciate it. Yeah, you can talk about that. So, so this morning, as we talk about the church, or as we call it here, the fellowship of the believers, it's in Acts 2, 42 through 47. This, this is what the life of the church is about right here. So please join me in the reading of the Fellowship of Believers, Acts 2, 42 through 47. Please join me on the odd verses. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking up of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Lord, we'd love to see a movement like that here. We'd love to see a movement where people were added to our number daily. Those who were becoming uh, saved. Like that, that, that's amazing work, amazing work of the church. And as we studied last week, the church moved from 120 to 3,120 in one day. And that's through your power. So, Lord, bring this, this, this good news, bring this scripture to life, how we can be. That same church, that the church that we had in common, because we are we are that same church that, that was established so long ago. We are that same church in Nepal. We are that same church. We have that in common. May we always know that we are one. We are the body. We are the body of Christ. We praise your name. Amen. So I asked this question, what is important to Harvard? This church, 
and I mean global church, we, we look at this passage and we see these things that were important to the church. They call it devotion. They, they were devoted. The church was devoted. The church was devoted to four things specifically that we're going to talk about today. That the first of it is, is the apostles' teaching. Now, that's kind of an interesting way to put it because the apostles' teaching was basically Jesus' teaching, right? The apostles' teaching was basically the gospel, it was the good news. So it's interesting that they call it the apostles' teaching, but that's, that's the way it was. It was always by the people that were sharing the good news, not necessarily who the good news was about, but it was about Jesus Christ. So the apostles' teaching is very important in this. In fact, we, as, as a Wesleyan church, really focus on the apostles' teaching. We could go back and say, Scripture, right? We could go back and say, Scripture is very important. The Wesleyan church actually even has this quadrilateral that John Wesley came up with, saying, Scripture is the most important thing that, that we filter our faith through. The second of these is tradition. Tradition is also important to us because we hold on to the same thing that people believe for through 2,000 years. That's important. It's not just about us, but it's about the people that have come before us. You know, it's not the game of telephone where things get changed through, through uh, time. It's something that stands true back then, just as it's true today. It is true. So the tradition is important, but it's also about the experience. Too. This is the third thing that we filter through our lives, you know, the experience. Because we have experiences in our life that are important, that are life-changing. Millie, you know, Millie is not here today, but if you ask her, she, she's had an experience where she, her, her life has changed. You know, one day she woke up on a Monday morning and knew that her cancer was gone. That Friday she went and visited the doctor, the good doctor told her the cancer was gone. How did she know that? She knew that God was doing this work in her, this, this, this amazing work of grace down her, that she's healed. That, that's an experience you can't take away from. Experience is important. We need experiences to, to hold on to. And, and, and for, for each one of you that have had the experience that know that that was a part of God, no one can convince you otherwise that it wasn't. Right? Experiences are important in our life. And also reason. Reason is another thing that we look at to, to, to look at our faith. Now this, this is a little bit interesting because we look at the fact that there is reason, but we also have to hold on to a bit of faith, too, right? We can't always go back to the idea of reason and, and truth, but we have to hold on to the actual idea of faith. But we can reason that Jesus, when he, during his resurrection time, 500 people saw him. That's fact, right? That, that, that is something that we believe. That is reason. And if you have 500 uh, witnesses in the court of law, Whatever they're witnessing to, they're going to find that that's fact, that is true. This, this is a very reasonable thing to look at. So we look at the Word of God being very important to, to us. We read, we study, we discuss, we obey, we grow, we live. It transforms us, it changes us. The second thing that the church was devoted to was fellowship. Fellowship is very important. What is fellowship? What does that mean? And that's one of those Christian words that we're like, oh, made up, we don't understand it, what's community? It's a collection. A collection of followers of Christ. Now, if you have any collection, you know, stamp collection, baseball cards collection, I don't know what you collect, but uh, there's tons of collections out there. Porcelain dolls, or maybe for girls, I don't know, tea sets, I don't know what girls collect. But whatever it might be, it's, it's a collection of similar things, right? It's a collection of, of, of like items. Well, fellowship is a collection of like believers. That, that we, we are at the same place at the same time, fellowshipping about our, our, our at least one identity and our identity in Christ. That's an amazing thing. Fellowship is important. Connecting in community with other followers is important. That's why we have growth groups. That's why we have times like this on a Sunday morning. That's why you, know, you, you come early and that's why you leave later. You don't just come from, from 10 to you know the closing prayer. You come and hang out. You fellowship with other people. That's why we have dinners and 
pot wash and so we can hang out with people that, that, that believe the same way that you do and so we can have encouragement and, and be equipped and, and be challenged in, in the way to go. The third thing that the church was devoted to was the breaking of bread. Communion. We're, we're, we're going to get to do that this morning. It's something that we share in common with them. That's an amazing thing that it's lasted 2,000 years that we can have something in common with each other. It's, it's the representation of the body of Christ. A sacrament. It's a means of grace. And we see by faith. It's, it's grace. That's awesome. And then prayer. The, the fourth thing that the church was devoted to is prayer. It's an independence of Christ. You know, all these four things, you know, different methods, different things that we do, but it's all things that have carried on through the test of time. It is now still with us today. It's, it's still an important thing, but they all have to do with the object, not necessarily how you do it. People take communion different ways. Today, we're passing it around in little cups of Jesus. You know, some people, you know, in times in the past, last time we did it, we, we did it in tension. You dip the bread. It's not necessarily the, what, what, what we do is important. It's, it's, it's who we're doing it for. It's, it's the remembrance of Christ. It's, it's that that holds us together. It's that common bond. And other churches, you know, they, they'll have a common cup and they'll drink from that common cup. You know, it's, it's all this thing. Same things, it's a little bit different in the method, but it's all the same thing, all the same focus, which is Christ. The devotion is Christ. The methods are what we do, and what we do is important, but the object of devotion is more important than how you show devotion. You know, the methods of how we will change, but the object will never change. So, we have the church that was devoted, and they were devoted to these four things, and these four things were important. They held on to them. But there were more things that was also the church could be defined by. The church could be defined as it was united. I love this idea that the church was united. You know, it says in verse 44, it says, All the believers were together and had everything in common. So they were united. They were united in belief. They were united in the things that they did together and so in proximity. They were united in joy. They, they were glad and sincere hearts. Right? So the church was united. <clears throat> the interesting thing about being united, they, they loved being together. You know, it says they, they met every day. Every day. Because they, they had so much joy for what was going on, they, they couldn't see a day without meeting with other fellow believers in, in the temple courts. And they broke threads in homes. It didn't matter that they would do anything and everything in their power to be together with, with the fellow believers every day. Could you imagine meeting together every day? I, I hear some Christians complaining about, hey, why do we have to go to church every Sunday, right? Like an hour or two on, on, on a weekend, right? But, like, but, but these were people that voted. And I know you guys have voted too, and you, you love getting together. But can you imagine meeting together in the temple courts, breaking breaking bread in their homes every day? That's that's a big deal. That's important. That 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 was something that held the bedrock together because because they didn't know what was going to happen. This this was a time where 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 they didn't know you know if Jesus was going to come back in the next day or or ten days or 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 twenty years or, or longer. They they just relied on the fact that they needed each other to be able to survive. And yet we live in a day where, you know, it's busy and we have all these things going on and we kind of just put things aside. That, you know, that, that's our culture. That's, that's, that's the way we deal with things. That's, that's what happens. But I kind of long for a culture in the sense that this is important. Where we take time out of our schedule to just breathe a moment and pause and reflect on who Christ is and understand that Christ is is there for us. And our fellow believers are there for us. You know, uh, a few weeks ago, I was talking to Marvin and Joanne in their home. We were getting a video ready together uh, for, for 120th anniversary. And one of the things that he, Marvin was talking about, he's like, it, it's just one of those things that builds you up and encourages you. You know, there's so many people that are going through life discouraged and, and struggling and and, and, and need some of that uplifting. 
Well, if Marvin's correct, you know, each week you get built up and you get encouraged, you're, not going, to, you're going to have a little bit more strength, a little bit more power, right? That's an important thing. We need that strength and that power. We need to be able to worship God because worshiping encourages our faith. If you're struggling in your faith, the best thing to do is to get with other people on Sunday and, and worship. Or, or get together uh, in a growth group and be able to talk about it. Your faith is only going to be encouraged through that. Every day. They couldn't get enough of each other. They couldn't wait until the next gathering. It wasn't a chore. They didn't feel obligated. But it was something they wanted to do. Verse 46, B continues, They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They loved being together. Glad and sincere hearts. Think about that. They, they, they were encouraged. They were challenged. And they were sincere. They were real. You know, it wasn't something that they were just doing to, to, to flow through life. It was important to them. So do we love being together or do we just tolerate it? You know? Being together, I love I hope you think it's an honor and a privilege and a joy. We get to praise God together. You know, this is one of the things that they got to do. And they enjoy the favor of all the people. I love that. Enjoy the favor of all the people. That, that is one of the coolest lines in, in verse 46 to 47. 40, 47. And, and, and to enjoy favor, think about that. Not only with the people that they were worshiping with, not only the people that, that were one and the same and united in, but they were able to win enjoy the favor of the community. They, they, they saw things going on and, and it was impacting people. And, and they started to grow. They, they started to be, you know, save other people. They started to bring them into their community and be able to change and grow and, and, and amazing things were happening. The thing is, you know, are we doing favor in relationships? Or are we just kind of postponing the relationships? Are, are we holding off those relationships and just kind of letting them go of them because, oh, we need this relationship, but not that. You know, are we gaining favor in our relationships? When I first came to the church here, I, I, I went around the community and asked, what do you think about the part of the church? You know, not telling them that I was a pastor and things like that. So they, you know, so, so they'd be honest. And, and they're like, well, honestly, we don't know much about it. You know, they, they, uh, you know, they seem like a good bunch of people, but, you know, they're kind of come by, keep to themselves. I know for a fact that that attitude has changed in the town. There's something different. There's some, some, something going on, and people are, are starting to know that, that, that we're that church that, that loves people, that church that is willing to, to go out and do outreach. And they're, they're the church that does the food pantry, even though we did the food pantry before. It, it seemed like no one knew about the food pantry except the ones that came to it, right? You know? So, so things are happening, and we're starting to gain favor with, with the people in town. We're starting to gain favor with the people that we come in contact with, and they're starting to know about us. But they only know about us because of the power of Jesus in our lives, and the power of, of Jesus that is being revealed to, to people. The church was united, but they were also generous. The church was generous. In verse 30, 45, it says, Some possessions and good. They gave to anyone as he had need. Think about that idea of generosity. I love generosity. How amazing it is to be able to help someone out in the time of need. To be able to, to just give without even having concern of, of, of where that money is, you know, if, if you're giving something away and you don't know if you're going to have enough in your own bank account to be able to take care of yourself. But that, that joy that happens, that gladness into your heart, that that empathy for someone knowing that they're going through a rougher time than you and, and, and they need something. And, it's, and I'm not even talking about just finances. I'm talking about all kinds of things. I'm talking about time. I'm talking about talent and treasures. Those things that, that we have that God has given us to be able to impact the people around us. You know, finances is one of those ways, but it's not the only way. You know, when, you, when you're able to take time out of your schedule. People understand that and realize that. I went and visited a guy in the hospital oh, a couple of weeks ago now, and, and he left a message, sent me a message, and he, he thanked me for doing it. I'm the only person that ever came to him. Wow. Like, really? Like, but, but 
you are thankful for that. You are thankful for that, even though he and I were close friends, and he doesn't come to this church, and, and things like that, God knew when he came to visit them. He, he knew that it was time out of my schedule, and, and, and he appreciated it. Something as small as that. Something as small as the, you know, I, I think I spent maybe 10 minutes there. 10 minutes. And it meant the world to him. You have to care. You have to be compassionate about the people that are going through things in life that just need to know that you love them. You care when someone is begging on the street. A few weeks ago, I saw, saw a guy in, in Cedar Rapids and he was sitting on his uh, wheelchair, one of those motorized scooters type thing. And, and he held up a sign that said, you know, we'll work. Or, um, Homeless bed, you know, we need help. You know, you pass by those people all the time, thinking, wonder what the story is. Oh, I'm too busy, though, to stop right now and just say, hey, how are you? Can I pray with you? you know, it's, it's interesting. You just drive right by. Keep on going. You need to be passionate. You need to be willing to spend time with people. One of my friends, a few years ago, I worked at a church in Logansport, Indiana, called Bridge Church. And at the time, it was two separate churches worshiping in, in, in the same facility. It was a white Anglo-Saxon uh, Protestant church and, and this Hispanic church. And <coughs> which, the Hispanic church was kind of growing, but the uh, white uh, church wasn't, wasn't growing. It, it was kind of stagnant. There were maybe even, you could say, dying. So he has, has this idea, you know, God gives it to him, of course, and says, why don't we combine churches? You know, the Spanish speaking church and this English speaking church, why don't we combine? So they started doing their services in, 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 uh, speaking bi bilingual, you know, two, two, so you have an interpreter. You, English or uh, 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 Spanish, and, and you have to do both whole thing. Or, or have the words up on the screen in both English and, and, and Spanish, you know. People were able to learn and be able to sing these songs together. And something about that church like lit, lit a fire. Now my friend <coughs> knew he couldn't take it any further because he wasn't bilingual himself. So he actually stepped out because of that. Not necessarily learning because he knew God had someone else for them that was able to be bilingual and come in. Now, this church has a heart, obviously, a heart for people who speak Spanish, but also for immigrants or who are coming into this town because this, this town is in, in Indiana, it's very uh, agricultural, it's very manufacturing, so a lot of immigrants are coming to this town looking for jobs. And, and of course, we, we know immigrants, you know, we, we have strong views about them, and whatever those views are, they're, they're people, so it's so, so lovely. So they knew that they wanted to reach out to these immigrants that were coming to town. So they started looking into things and, and started to figure out, well, oh, people trying to get legal status in the United States are having a hard time to do it because there's only so many people that are able to walk into this process, the immigration lawyers are things like that. So the pastor now there, Zach, and Zach learns and takes this course about how to help people transition in the United States and, 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 and get legal status. And, and, and now he's, he's the first church in the United States there that, that was able to get uh, a status of being able to be an immigration help site. And now it's something that's starting all over the West Main Church, you here and there, that are you know, three approved sites now. And I, I know one's coming to water. You know, Michelle Feltis uh, uh, out of the uh, Real Life Church, she's going to go get trained and be able to do the same process to help uh, the immigrants in, in, in water. Isn't this great that we can, can see and hear stories like this and, and, and help change people's lives? You know, our job, job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they were worthy. And this is just one more way the church can do it. I don't see this as something we can do, but we can point them towards real life. You know, 
hard time that you have a lot of immigrants in it, but you know, the big city is pointing to it, towards that and your life. There's something that God's calling us to do, something that might be a little bit off the walls, might be a little bit different, that, that God's saying, I want you to do this. That I don't know what that is next. God's pulling, but He's saying, there's something for you guys. So as, as, as we go through this time, pray with me. God, what, what are you leading us to do? What are you asking us to do? You know, we know that the church was devoted, the church was united, and the church was generous. And I think you can ask, um, ask anybody in this church that we're in that same place. They, they didn't know exactly which direction they were going to go. They didn't, they didn't have a mission statement of it, and what Jesus called them to do was go out and make disciples. And that's our same mission today. To go and make disciples. To love God, love others, and serve all. And that's, that's how we do it. But God's asking us to do something more, to step up in, in faith and say, what do you have for us? You know, the church was devoted, the church was united, the church was generous. I think devoted sounds a little bit like what we got. I think the, the, the idea of being united sounds a little bit more like what we have for loving others. The idea of being generous means it's a little bit more like serving all. What can we say about heart? What can we say that God might be leading us to do. So pray with me. I'm going to ask him, uh, Ben to, to come up and we're going to have a time where, where we can commune together. Where, where we listen to this song that we sing and we take the elements together. So I'm going to ask these ushers to come forward. And, and we're going to take the music together. We're going to partake of the bread. And they're going to pass it out, just hold on to it. And we'll take it as one, because we think this is hot. There's going to be churches all over the United States and the world taking this communion. There's churches all over the world that will be praying for Nepal. And this is the stuff that we have in common. We need to hold on to the things that we have in common. So today, as the ushers come forward and, and we take our tithes and offerings and listen to Ben saying, Ask God, what are you leading us to do? Where are you asking us to go? What are you asking us to do in the Lord's city? The Blackout County, the Bend County. What are you asking us to do? Let us go to the Lord. Lord, what are you asking us to do? We know that these things that we hold in common with the church, that we hold on to. You know, the apostles teach you. That is an amazing thing. This fellowship, this breaking of bread and prayer. We need a whole lot of those things. But we need to direct all those things for you and know that you are the source, that you will guide us, that you are our power and our strength and our mercy and our compassion. So Lord, we look to you. We say thank you. We say thank you for, for sending your son to die so that we might live. We thank you that Christ was able to defeat death and was able to resurrect his life and defeat death. We thank you. We thank you for that power, and we thank you for, for letting us know that it's that same power that can change us and change the world. The church is the hope of the world. Amen.